Hi, welcome to B&H Real Exposures, where we interview today's top pros. We ask these rock stars of imaging in-depth questions to get insight you won't find anywhere else. I'm David Brummer, your host of Real Exposures, and today we're sitting with Lauren Greenfield, a rare creative. Lauren blurs the line and is still in the moving image. Since graduating from Harvard in the Visual and Environmental Studies program, her career is as illustrious as could be. Lauren is the recipient of numerous awards, indeed too many to mention here, but most important in recent, Lauren was awarded the Sundance Film Festival Directing Award for her feature documentary, The Queen of Versailles. This amazing film is either being nominated for or winning film festivals all the way from Brisbane, Australia to the Directors Guild of America. Lauren works and explores and tackles issues relating to youth culture, gender, eating disorders, wealth, fashion, beauty, and consumerism. We here at Real Exposures are ecstatic to be able to have such a relevant and contemporary powerhouse visit us. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you for coming. Thank you. This is really, truly an honor. Oh, thanks for having me. So I want to congratulate you on The Queen of Versailles. Uh, my wife and I are, uh, are avid moviegoers, and, and she saw it in the movies and raved about it, and we recently Netflixed it. And just as a barometer to show how amazing it was, uh, we have a tradition that we watch a movie and then we discuss it afterwards. I think we talked about the movie for about two hours afterwards, and it really stuck with us. My name is David Siegel. My name is Jacqueline Siegel. <laughs> I am the founder, CEO of the largest timeshare company in the world. I'm a 43-year-old mother of eight. I thought she was the most beautiful girl in the world. It took me a while to fall in love with him. We have a great relationship. There's 30 years between us, but he doesn't need Viagra. At least there is that option if he does, like, I don't know if 10 years from now. <laughs> We never sought out to build the biggest house in America. It just kind of happened. It's bigger than the White House. Two tennis courts. 30 bathrooms. Full-size baseball field. 10 kitchens. Antique furniture. 90,000 square feet. Oh, my God. No, that's not my room. That's my closet. No way. Nothing's really normal about this life. We are in line to do a billion dollars in sales for the year. We are on top of the world. And it came to a screeching halt. The market fell over 700 points. I would say it's touch and go right now. We don't talk about financial problems. I guess I'll have to watch the movie to find out <laughs> what's going on in my life. When everything changes. This is almost like a riches to rags story. She knows we need to cut back, but she's still compulsive. <laughs> what time is it now? Well, if I could afford a watch, I would tell you. Bankers are like vultures. Our big problem is Vegas. Our lenders have made it very clear that he'll have more money than he knows what to do with. He can go back to building his house if he turns over this building. It's over my dead body. You can buy the palace that timeshare mogul David Siegel already wants to sell. Just think of the bright side. You might not have to clean this house. <laughs> The American dream is raising way up above what you started with, and that is what she has done. When you're down is when you find out who your true friends are. You get strength from your marriage? No. I'm in this fantasy world, you know, until reality hits. The film moves along in a wonderful way, and I really enjoyed watching the way that uh, uh, the uh, the way the story unfolds itself. And I understand that uh, it was part of the Sundance Film Lab. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Film Lab is and how did that help out the sure, movie? Sure, yeah, the, the Sundance Documentary um, Edit and Structure, Story Edit and Structure mm -hmm. Lab, which was amazing for me because I studied photography and social studies and mm -hmm. a little bit of documentary, but a long time ago and in a very cinema verite way. and. This was my first chance to actually, I didn't go to graduate school in film, and this was mm -hmm. my chance to really learn story structure. And The Queen of Versailles was different than any film I've done before and really stretched me in terms of the narrative. I mean, for one, I had characters that, um, if you didn't know they were real, you would almost think were out of fiction. Mm -hmm. And a very dramatic narrative arc um, that, in a way, um, required more structure mm -hmm. than previous work that I've done. And so what happened at the lab was you get to, there are five film projects there, and mm -hmm. you go with an editor. 
and you work with your editor and then you have mentors and one of my mentors i mean the mentors are amazing and i actually drafted them all not only did they help me during that week but they actually helped me take the movie home over the next six months and um, one of my mentors was my film teacher from harvard rob moss so it was amazing kind of coming back to that early relationship and um, one of the things i was working on was um, having these bigger than life characters who I felt a lot of affection for, mm -hmm. but who many people when they first saw didn't like or had a kind of knee jerk reaction to the 1%. And part of that was figuring out how to cut the film so that the qualities that I saw in them could come out. And I think the most gratifying part to me in the end was when we showed it at film festivals and when I heard people's reaction, they said that they were surprised that they did like the characters, they did feel empathy for the characters. And mm -hmm. I think the best moment for me was the New York Times A.O. Scott's review where he said something like, laugh if you want at the gilded frames, but if this is a portrait, but don't kid yourself, if this is a portrait, it's also a mirror. And that was definitely how I always felt that what happened with Jackie and David's story mm -hmm. is that they begin as the story of the 1%, as a story you can't believe it's so big. They're building a 90,000 square foot house inspired by the Palace of Versailles. And then when they get hit by the economic crisis, when they have to give up this dream, when they have to put this dream house up for sale, and by the end when the house actually goes into foreclosure, you realize that their story is really an allegory about the overreaching of America and a supersized version of what happened to so many Americans at all different levels on the economic scale. And this is not a story about rich people or about the 1%, but really a story about the mistakes that we all made mm -hmm. that led to the economic crisis. David Siegel this is a victim as well as a, uh, a user of the system. Well, that was the thing that was so interesting about David Siegel's story and Timeshare, which in a way, I did get lucky in in the sense that when I started it, I really came in through Jackie. She was the one mm -hmm. I met. I had met her while photographing Donatella Versace. She mm -hmm. was one of Donatella's best customers at the time. Um, it started serendipitously, but she was building the biggest house in America. That was my interest there and the connection between home ownership and the American dream. That was the thing that was so interesting is I didn't know he was in the timeshare mm -hmm. business and the timeshare actually wasn't really relevant of the film to the film until timeshare was the tipping point on the economic mm -hmm. crisis affecting this family. And the fact that David was on both sides of the crisis, mm -hmm. he was both banker and borrower. He was both victim and perpetrator. Mm -hmm. His whole business was based on cheap financing and the mm -hmm. banks giving him money, but he also was financing his clients to buy timeshares. His clients were often working class and middle class people mm -hmm. who were also going for a piece of aspirational luxury that maybe they could afford, maybe they couldn't mm -hmm. afford. And then David in turn was building Versailles looking for a piece of that aspirational Reaching luxury, so far, right. which in the end he couldn't afford. So that was why he was such a, in such an amazing role. But the masterful stroke was the, the storytelling that you did. It was 200 hours of, of footage that you had shot, and you broke it down into the documentaries, what, an hour and 50 minutes long, or? An hour uh, and 40 minutes. Um, that's, which, by the way, is the, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. For, those, those, for all the filmmakers that are out there, there's no need to you can tell your story in under two hours. You should. There's some <laughs> extras on the DVD if you're really uh, <laughs> die hard. Um, you know, I think the editing process was, um, in a way, the most important creatively. And I think it was the most challenging because in the field, the story did unravel magically. Every time we were there, something incredible happened. Every time we were there, we couldn't believe what was happening. We were like, did, did this really just happen <laughs> that they just put this house for sale? Did this really just happen that... The nanny said she hadn't seen her kids in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Did this really just happen that Cliff the limo driver happened to b have been a, a real estate speculator right. himself and lost all his money? Did this really happen that Virginia the nanny moved into the dollhouse and took over the mm -hmm. dollhouse thanks to Jackie 
giving that to her. There were so many things that do you if go it to a happened in fiction, you won't believe. Do you go to a drive through at McDonald's with a limo? <laughs> exactly. We were actually going to a charity event with Jackie, and then on the way back, she says, let's stop and get something to eat. There's a McDonald's. Of course, she often stopped at fast food, but the fact that she did it in the limo was so mm -hmm. symbolic. And um, that was kind of amazing. And then in the, in the editing, how to tell the story so that um, it, it, it can be clear what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. which is that it's not just about Jackie and David. We can't just say they're the only people mm -hmm. who overreached. We need to be able to see ourselves in them, and we need to understand that this was a mistake that was made across the board. That's part of why I included Virginia, the nanny story, mm -hmm. and her interpretation of the American mm -hmm. dream. Cliff, the limo driver, and her interpretation. Mm -hmm. John Quill, the niece that Jackie adopted out of poverty mm -hmm. from Binghamton, the same town Jackie mm -hmm. grew up in, who overnight came into the mansion and so had a similar arc to Jackie, but mm -hmm. in a compressed period of time. And, and also uh, the sympathy for all the employees of, of Westgate and David's empire who lost their jobs when that when the empire took its hit. And I think one of the reasons that you do um, empathize with Jackie and David is you do see how they do care for the employees. And that was something I didn't necessarily expect, that David was devastated by having to mm -hmm. um, let go of employees. And that the domestic employees actually feel very fondly for David and Jackie, and they treat their people well, even though, of course, there's a class structure mm -hmm. there, too. But um, I think those are the things that, and, and also the other thing that really drew me to Jackie and David is that they don't live in this hierarchical class structure, that there are people in their world from all different backgrounds, mm -hmm. that the people they grew up with and their families who did not grow up rich are still part of their world, that they're mm -hmm. friends from childhood. Jackie right. still has this amazing ability to be able to sit down with her working class friends from childhood or sit down with the billionaires next door and be mm -hmm. equally comfortable in both worlds. And that was something that I think made them accessible also. I think that also may be true uh, of Americans in general. Um, you know, even like Bush 43 looks like a guy that you could you could sit down and have a Budweiser with and right. talk about football. It's uh, I don't know. I th yeah, it's interesting. We showed this film in England, and I thought in England <laughs> they're going to think these are the big ugly Americans that they love to laugh with mm -hmm. at. And actually, no, they really love Jackie, <laughs> and I think that was because she's not a snob. Mm -hmm and they come from a more of a class structure. And so she's a little bit more refreshing and unusual mm -hmm. in that way. Well, she's very likable, so that, that, that comes through. So as a side note to, uh, to this, uh, when you go to release the film at, at Sundance, there's press releases that go out, and uh, David Siegel launches a, a lawsuit against you uh, for defamation of character based upon those releases. On January 25th of this year, uh, it was, the ruling was, was thrown out. What type of advice would you have for documentarian filmmakers to avoid getting close to the subjects and then facing a potential lawsuit? Well, I think it was pretty unusual what happened. I've been doing this work for 25 years, and this is the first time I've found myself in a lawsuit, um, and it was a completely frivolous lawsuit at that. So I think the surprise was really that it happened in the first place. Mm. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we live in a world where um, people in big companies can start lawsuits just for the publicity or for make, sending a message to um, their business or their investors without any grounds. And of course, the lack of grounds is why it was thrown out. But um, you know, I think what you have to do in your work is be honest with people, let them know what you're doing, which mm -hmm. we did. Um, I always have people sign model releases, mm -hmm. which um, not only protects you legally, but I think it also makes it clear what you're doing mm -hmm. and what this is for and how it can be used. And so I find that's really helpful. Um, and then I think you have to have total integrity in your process, mm -hmm. which we did. This was a film mm -hmm. that we made with the full cooperation of the Siegel family for almost a three-year period. Okay. We were, this was not an investigative, project, every single shoot was an access shoot where we were there only by the grace and by the invitation of the subjects. And I think that is um, a relationship that you just have to trust in and navigate yourself. It could have been stopped at any point, and we, I was really lucky that 
they chose to continue at every turn. That's the subjects really did open up to you. How do you get subjects to open up to you? I mean, like, I mean, peeking the camera into his office when he's when he's going crazy with his losses and and trying to leverage things. How, how do you get your subjects to open up like I that? I mean, I think that the amazing thing about Jackie and David as subjects and as characters is that they opened their doors wide when things were great and they wanted to, they were proud of building the biggest mm -hmm. house in America and wanted to show that to the world, but they kept them open mm -hmm. equally wide when things got tough. And I think that's also a, a testament to their character and their confidence in their own stories. I don't think they ever felt any shame or embarrassment over mm -hmm. their own stories. I think they both had a sense of pride in where they had come from, where they had got to, and I think in a way their hard knock beginnings gave them a strength that made them survivors, and they both were able to say, mm -hmm. we can survive without the house, we can survive without all this stuff. On the other hand, I think David always thought he would pull it out in the end, and I often did too. When you hear his life story, which I did in the very first interview, he's battled much adversity, and, mm -hmm. and so is Jackie, I found out, as we progressed mm -hmm. into the story. And so right. I think that it could have had a different ending, and I think David would have preferred that ending, and I think ultimately the lawsuit is really just over the ending, and he said as much. He said that he liked the film and thought it was mm -hmm. well done, but he doesn't like the ending. I know from Jackie that he doesn't like when the Westgate light goes off at the end of the film, and I understand that because it was a very painful period in his life, mm -hmm. and that's where the film ends. Now, for me, that was important because the film begins on the dream. It begins on the dream of the house. Very soon into the film, we realize that David has an even bigger dream, building the tallest, most expensive timeshare in the world in Las Vegas, the place that was so important mm -hmm. to his parents. Over $600 mm -hmm. million dollar price tag on this building, for which he has to borrow money from the lenders. That ends up being the overreach that costs him his personal mm. fortune and nearly takes down the whole company. He says over my dead body, I won't let go of this building, but in the end he lets go of the building and that enables the rest of the business to survive. Mm. And so it was a morality tale and when he gives up Las Vegas and when Versailles is in foreclosure, that was the end of the story for me. So, okay, that, that was a question I was going to ask is, when do you know when a story ends? You know, when I think <laughs> we don't often know, and sometimes it's when your money runs out or when your deadline <laughs> is. In this case, um, it was clear because of these really important story points and symbols mm -hmm. of Versailles and of Vegas. And when those both came to their end, Versailles, was about to be auctioned mm -hmm. off by Bank of America, was in foreclosure, and Vegas was let go of. Mm -hmm. and, and Vegas, by the way, was let go of after our last shoot, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's included in the titles. And so I think knowing that, that was the end of that the story. Good. So it seems that all your work to date, it, it has a thread of social commentary on beauty, wealth, consumerism. And uh, as I researched you, I sort of likened your work to uh, the FSA photographers, but taken as a whole, because you're just looking at a, a slice in, in particular uh, America now, even though you did start with uh, uh, your first project, the uh, survivors of the French Revolution. Uh, I'm curious though, what were you doing in high school? What, were, when was your, what was your first camera? How did you start on this yes. documentarian role? And I actually started photography. I was lucky in that I, I went to an alternative school that had all these different mm -hmm. kinds of art classes, and so I started photography when I was in um, elementary school. I got to do some photographic work. And then in high school, I, um, I photographed at, my dad was a doctor who had started this free clinic, who, and he, I photographed at the clinic. And so I was always kind of interested in social issues and sociologically based work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I grew up in Venice, California, and there was mm -hmm. this um, old there was this old home for immigrant Jew immigrant elderly Jews um, called the Israel Levin Center. Mm -hmm. And I photographed there, and my teacher I think she said, "Why don't you photograph their hands?" And so I photographed the hands of these women and won the Jewish Historical Award and ended up getting this National Foundation for Advancement of the Arts Award, which 
was a real boost for me then. I never thought of myself as an artist. I did photography because I was bad in all the arts, like painting and sculpture and drawing. <laughs> and um, it was a real boost, confidence-wise. I went to Harvard. I wasn't going to go to art school. I never thought I would become an artist. But, um, but once I was in college and I was studying social studies and looking at economics and anthropology, I ended up going back to photography because I liked that mm -hmm. more direct mm -hmm. humanistic approach rather than the theoretical or academic one of my social theory. After you win awards, uh, you, you create something, you win awards, uh, you get a, a paycheck. Beyond that, what do you hope to achieve with the work that you've decided to really dedicate your life to? Um, first of all, you don't always get a paycheck from the creating the work <laughs> and the awards. I think that's uh, uh, something we all have to navigate in, mm -hmm. in being able to do the work that's most important to you and figuring out how to sustain it and yourself at the same time. But um, you were asking about how... When you go to sleep at night, what, what is it that you want to achieve with your work aside oh. from... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I know as an artist, we, all, we feel the need to create, and that comes out, so that, that's obviously there. But what, is there anything on this, because you're very specific on this, this mechanism that right. you've chosen. You know, I kind of, um, I mean, I ha I, I've always been really interested in sociologically based work, and I have always been inspired by work that comments on society mm -hmm. or reveals something to us that we didn't know. And I look to Robert Frank and, and mm -hmm. Um, Lee Friedlander and Gary Winogrand and Deanne Arbus as people mm -hmm. who have showed us our world in a way that makes us think about the world in a different way. And I think that's what I try to do is the work is more about creating questions and creating discussion than providing mm -hmm. answers. Okay. And I go into it with an open mind to see what these things that compel me are about and try to create a conversation. So the biggest compliment that, that you gave me was that you and your wife discussed the Queen of Versailles for two hours, because that, I think, is the power of this mm -hmm. kind of work, is creating questions, creating provoking discussion. Well, your work with girl culture and anorexia and eating disorders, I think, is, is very important. I mean, I, I know for uh, a fact that it, it's, I know someone whose daughter uh, went through this, and uh, she watched Thin, and that, that helped her, and she went through uh, a long uh, in Colorado in a, a hospital in Colorado was a long process and she's thriving now but uh, you know work that you've done it has an influence well, on people. Well thank you I mean I've tr I try to do work that is important to me and hope that will be important to other people mm -hmm. I also made a decision early in my career that I was not going to follow the exotic and not going to follow the other but that I was going to focus on my own world and issues that were relevant to both me, my history, and people that I knew. And um, I think in a way that um, a lot, it, it, allows it, it allows me to reflect too on, on what's important in my own mm -hmm. life and, and also the problems that I mm -hmm. see around me. I think one of the things we've tried to do is we saw from the beginning of Fast Forward coming out, my first book, how young people had an ability to relate to the work and understand the work in mm -hmm. a very intuitive way. So around all of the subsequent projects, Girl Culture, Thin, um, we've created educational curriculum mm -hmm. that, and, and also done museum shows that bring in young people and that allow the work to go to a more diver diverse and bigger audience. And that's been one of the most exciting things about film is how broad it's allowed the audience to be. I mean, I never mm. would have imagined having a film in the theaters, and then after the theaters, for it to go on iTunes and Netflix, and and for it to be seen by the numbers of people it was seen, it just opened your work in a completely different way. I came back from London last week, and when I went through customs in LAX, the customs officer didn't ask me what the purpose of my trip was. He said, oh, what a coincidence you're coming through. I just saw Queen of Versailles. Mm what's happening with David Siegel <laughs> these days? <laughs> and it, it was just like that, you know, kind of it's refreshing to know penetration so, was uh, amazing. <laughs> so that's been really exciting for me in terms of um, reaching an audience. I think it's also important, uh, you're a woman and, and you're a filmmaker, which is a, a rarity. Uh, the Oscars in its an entire uh, career has only had four nominated best directors. So that's uh, what, uh, 
you as a woman filmmaker, I think that your subjects open up to you differently because you are a woman, uh, but how can you give some advice to, uh, to aspiring woman filmmakers? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I was recently nominated for a DGA award, which I was really proud of because mm -hmm. of the history of that guild mm -hmm. being male dominated, but I look to um, the, what the, one of the other nominees who was there, which is Catherine Bigelow, mm -hmm. who really doesn't um, self-identify specifically as a female filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, even though my work um, has often been about gender, and in some ways I've gone to some places that I was drawn to because I was a woman, and I think also my access depended on being a woman. Thin, for example, we had to have an all-female mm -hmm. crew working in a female mm -hmm. residential clinic. On the other hand, when I'm working, I'm just doing the work, and I'm not mm -hmm. doing the work or showing the work specifically as a woman. It's just the work. I follow my heart. That's what I want to do, and then I try to put it out in the world. And I think that that's all any of us can do. I think that one of the things um, that's happened in photography is people really value voice and the subjective mm -hmm. voice and perspective. And so if women haven't been as represented before, that's an opportunity for a fresh perspective. And I think that, that I benefited from that, from, from um, in a way covering women's issues in a way that hadn't been seen as much before. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I feel really strongly that we live in a free market which is too competitive for sexism ultimately and I think that you know good work rises and so I don't think that it is um, you know that there is um, there are barriers to female driven films I mean a lot of the um, editors that I work with at, at both in TV and film in magazines a lot of them are women and so um, I do think that there are um, you know, that, that the best work rises. Yeah, I, I think it's really refreshing to hear you say that. I, I tend to view the world uh, as the work that you produce as opposed to color, gender, and, uh, and you just reaffirm something for me. So I, I appreciate that in a big way. Just to spin things around a little bit differently, uh, about technology. Technology has been changing dramatically. You're a Canon Explorer of Light. Um, how has uh, the technology, HD DSLR, and what's been going on affected your work and what you can do? Well, I think when I started film, my first film was in 2004. And by the way, after college, I did try to do film. And at that time, it was too expensive and too cumbersome equipment-wise to just do it on your own. That mm -hmm. I would have needed to go to film school or be part of a bigger organization. I think one of the things that's changed is that you can make films on your own now. And, mm. um, and then there's also been this amazing um, convergence between motion and still, where on the internet we kind of go seamlessly mm -hmm. back and forth, we get our news back and forth. I think that is really exciting. I think the fact that you know, we can do editing in our own studio with Final Cut Pro and Avid um, is great. And it's become much more accessible. On the other hand, um, I also really believe in teams and crews mm -hmm. and expertise and feel like that part has not changed and that you know when I've made films I haven't done them one-man band when I, I often work with a DP who I think is a better cinematographer than I am I feel mm -hmm. like it's take it takes a lifetime to become good mm -hmm. at photography if I had started at cinematography, I might be great at that, but I didn't, and I need to work with somebody who is. For me, we're making films and getting to direct is a chance to collaborate with talented mm -hmm. people, and I learn as much from my editor and my cinematographer as I do from the subjects, and it's, and it's a team effort. And um, you know, some of the technology has allowed us to be smaller mm -hmm. and to edit smaller, and you know, there's some parts that have gotten less expensive, but at the end of the day, film is a very expensive process, and a big part of it is the talent, and I think mm. that part has not changed as much as people think. Lorna, I, I want to thank you for coming and speaking with us at Real Exposures. This has really been a delight. You've got so much to say, and you're such a, a relevant force. Um, for those of you in the, uh, in the audience who hasn't seen The Queen of Versailles, uh, don't walk, run to your <laughs> local store or get online and, and uh, Netflix this one because it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a beautiful film. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming. Thank it's a pleasure. You. Thanks, Thanks a for having me. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.